something like 130,000 to 140,000 people. These are mostly Vietnamese people. People who'd been associated with the old South Vietnamese regime or associated with the United States, some way connected to the United States, were evacuated and resettled mostly in the United States in the wake of the fall of Saigon to North Vietnamese forces. This is the end of the Vietnam War. So an evacuation program for 140,000 people. Pretty amazing stuff. That's a major, major evacuation and resettlement program. But here's the crazy thing. It was barely the beginning, and by the time it all ended, it would look like nothing. See, 1975, the year this happened, this is the year that a now united Vietnam fell under a communist dictatorship. It's the same year that Cambodia became communist and Laos became communist. In other words, all of what had been French Indochina fell to communism in 1975. The problem with communism is that it doesn't work. I mean, it just doesn't, okay? 20th century history demonstrates clearly that when practically applied in the real world, Marxist statist communism tends not only to fail miserably as an economic system, I mean, pathetically in terms of production, but also tends strongly to preach democratic empowerment while actually empowering a small group of oligarchs, tends to crush civil liberties, I mean, erase civil liberties, they don't even register, tends to imprison or kill those who disagree with the regime, and tends to mass starve millions to the tune of tens of millions, large segments of the population under which it rules. I mean, that's the track record of communism. And all these things happen in Laos, in Cambodia, and in Vietnam, just as they'd happen in China and in the USSR. Something like a million South Vietnamese city dwellers, okay, these are urbanites, were herded into the countryside where they were forced to clear land and work the fields and farm and do things that they didn't know how to do. Of course, mass suffering was the result. Hundreds of thousands more, these are people who'd been somehow associated with the old government, the old South Vietnamese government, were uh, themselves herded into re-education camps. Okay? There's that dubious term, re-education camp. Now, these camps mixed hard labor with propaganda sessions, torture, you know, starvation, disease, and death. Meanwhile, the government severely economically repressed much of the population, putting in place trade restrictions, you know, confiscating entire businesses, and targeting specific segments of the population with heavy taxes. The, the ethnic Chinese were particularly targeted in this regard. Next door in Cambodia, things were far worse. And in Laos, things weren't much better. Combine these conditions with the rest of the fallout of decades of war, you know, with France and then with the United States, and then regionally, one with another, and uh, you sort of created the perfect storm for a major refugee crisis. Of course, that's what happens. In 1975, with the fall of Saigon, you know, in the two or three years after that, thousands of Vietnamese were already trying to flee their country um, by boat. Okay, and it wasn't pretty, and many of them never made it. But by 1978, with all the re-education camps and the forced relocations, the starvation, disease, death, confiscations, economic repression, and all that stuff, to the regional war, the demand for escape had increased dramatically, I mean exponentially. The result was one of the largest peacetime migrations in human history. And unfortunately for those fleeing regional war and communist tyranny, for a long time there was nowhere to go. Crammed onto countless boats, some of them just little fishing boats, tens of thousands of these people braved the journey out into the blue every month by the late 1970s. Tens of thousands a month. And hundreds of thousands of these people, now it's, it's impossible to nail down an exact number, but it seems that hundreds of thousands of these people died in the attempt. Uh, they, they drowned, they starved, you know, they were often picked up, robbed, raped, and or killed by pirates, lost at sea, uh, lost in typhoons, uh, you know, and all the while mostly turned away by other Southeast Asian countries. And after several years of international get-togethers and conferences and things, uh, a lot of this was mostly worked out in terms of establishing refugee status and camps for these people. But uh, of course, by then the damage had been done. Now the boat people, those who actually physically escaped in boats, or at least attempted to, they represent only a segment 
of millions of immigrants and refugees during this period out of Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. Okay, something like three million people left. Many of them, of course, did not make it to their final destination, but three million people. And in particular, entire populations almost of, you know, these are peoples and groups that had been loyal to the United States during the Vietnam War were eventually resettled either in refugee camps regionally or in the United States. So for example, the Hmong of Laos, who continued to fight the communists there, you know, for years after the U.S. had left, hundreds of thousands of them were eventually resettled in places like California and Minnesota. You know, the Yu Mien of Laos also, tens of thousands resettled in the United States and in refugee camps. Uh, the Central Highlanders of Vietnam, the Degar people, half a million of them found their way into refugee camps or were resettled in the United States. These guys, by the way, continued to fight the communist government in Vietnam into the 1990s. You know, and many others, half a million other Vietnamese immigrated to the United States by the mid-1990s. By the way, this is, a, uh, this is an interesting phenomenon that you notice when you study empires. You can't have, you can't maintain a homogenous society. You can't maintain borders language culture in any sort of you know, static condition and have an empire. You can't have both. Empires breed diversity and multiculturalism. That's just what they do. So you can't have homogeneity, borders, language, and culture, and empire. You know, Take a stroll through London, take a stroll through Paris, take a stroll through New York and LA for that matter to see this, this phenomenon on display. Now there are many in my country right now who you know, right or wrong, worry for their own culture. They feel that their culture is under attack, in particular by foreigners, foreign value systems, uh, you know, foreign customs and traditions, and inflow of foreign people. Now, right or wrong, these same people are often gung-ho about the empire. They're on the front lines of, of an imperial or interventionist foreign policy. This is the very policy that history would suggest contributes to the eating away of your homogenous society. You can't have empire and maintain borders language culture. It's just not going to happen. So it's sort of an interesting phenomenon, and one that you see here. The U.S. was involved militarily in Vietnam, you know, very heavily for years, and also involved in Cambodia and Laos, uh, particularly through devastating, almost genocidal bombing. And uh, one result is that you have millions of these people uh, relocating to the United States. So in sum, something like 3 million people from Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia during this period fled those countries and ended up often via refugee camps in Southeast Asia, uh, in the United States, in Canada, Europe, Australia. Another half million returned to their home countries, often forcefully returned, while hundreds of thousands more, mostly boat people, of course, never made it. They died along the way. Those hundreds of thousands dead were victims both of the imperialist policies of so-called capitalist countries as well as the brutal tyranny of communist ones.